So if you watch TV, and if you go on YouTube, you type in the word entrepreneur, shark, shark tank, you're gonna see this face here sitting to my left, to your right, four-time Emmy Award-winning show, Shark Tank, I think 199 episodes, nine seasons, and uh, she is probably responsible in the last several years of inspiring so many young women, ladies who are coming up saying, I just want to be an entrepreneur. I want to go out there and compete in the marketplace. I feel I can bring value. I feel I can make a lot of money and become successful because she's been the inspiration to so many people out there. And today with us is Barbara Cochran. How Pleasure. are you? Very nice being here. Pleasure but I meeting you. I want to correct you for a minute if I Tell me. I've also inspired some men out there. Oh, I'm certain of that. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. you didn't say that. Now, I'm so, so men and there women go. is what we have to put out there. Okay. <laughs> So prior to, you know, who you are today, everyone sees you on TV, you're seeing it. You can't turn on the TV nowadays without having Shark Tank playing on some channel. There's yes, something going on there. CNBC specifically. Who was Barbara before Barbara became a shark today? Oh, in high school, I was the quiet kid in the whole high school. I never said a word. I had terrible acne. I was overweight. I was a dumb kid in class, so I just kept in under. In high school? In high school, yeah. And I didn't have a boyfriend. I didn't have a boyfriend until I was 23 because I didn't look so good. So in high school, I was not very, I was not the person I wanted to become. Really? Yeah. Definitely. How did you do with grades in school? Um, I got a charity D in just about every subject I ever took. I couldn't learn to read or write till I was in seventh grade. And for me, my memory of school was like one long prison sentence. And when was I going to get out? <laughs> so we went to the same prison together. Yeah, we did. Yeah, oh my gosh. Pretty interesting. I hated reading. <laughs> yeah. I had a teacher well, named Miss Collins. Reading, I hate most things in oh, school. Oh, Miss Collins would make me read. And it was Of Mice of Men, or that was then, this is now. Of Mice of Men? That was the book we read. God, that, that I never was... got past Spot and Jane. Oh, so you, well, you got to read. I came here in seventh grade, so prior to this, oh. I was in Germany at a refugee camp. So so oh. what happens after high school? You come high out of high school. school. Um, well, I shouldn't say high school was all that bad because I always worked. I worked from the time I was 11. I always had a job after school. On weekends, I worked like crazy. And I had a variety of jobs. Nothing that important, but things I really loved doing. Once high school was over, I, I went to college, thank God, because I didn't want to get married and have babies. I mm -hmm. didn't have anybody to marry. <laughs> and that's what everybody in my little hometown did. Now, Barbara, yeah. big family. You're, you're, oh, you were one telling of ten. me. Yes, we had ten children. I'm second oldest. And we have a very tight-knit family, even to today. Um, we're all still here, fortunately. Growing up with a lot of children uh, is a wonderful way to grow up, I believe, because you learn so many of the things you're going to need in life. So in my family, everyone that got out of... Uh, out of our household, we were thrown out by my parents at 18. They said, time to support yourself. Send some money back if you're making a little extra change. Really? And we all felt that obligation. Uh, but they felt we should be out and out, out on our own. Very different than the landscape today. Interesting. Yeah. But you know what? You knew it was coming. It was like your parents uh, were lowering the hatch on you uh, for years before it actually came down. So you kind of prepared for it. it. You knew you had to go out and fend for yourself. Was it a competitive family? Was it extremely competitive? Listen, you do the math on that. If you have 10 children, a year and a half apart, and only two parents to share, do you think it's competitive? Dinner's competitive, getting the big piece of meat at the little dinner table, uh, getting the right seat at the table, uh, getting your mother's attention, pretending you're sick, you could stay home from school, notice me, I'm sick, please notice me, I'm sick. Everything was competitive. But again, what is wonderful about that is you grow up almost like you're in an outside world versus a family unit, mm. and you have to perform a function, you have to compete with each other all the time to get to what you, where you wanna go. And so the transition to the outside world was very easy. It almost seemed easier to compete in business for me than it was back at the farm. What a great yeah. point. So point to everybody, go have 10 babies so you produce <laughs> no. competitive kids. I would think about that one. I only have two, I'm not having 10. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens after college? So well, you after take college, history, I had a very that. lucky break. I was, I was a diner waitress in a town above my small town in New Jersey. And um, a man walked in and sat at my counter. He was almost 10 years older than I, Ramon, Simone, with an accent on both words. Ramon? And he, Ramon, uh, Simone. And he said he was from the Basque country. I didn't know where that was. But I That's a player, not a kidder right there. Well, I didn't know he was a player. All I knew is he had navy blue aviator shades on. He had a real suit with a starch collar. I'd never seen a guy in a suit before. That's pretty sexy. That's like seeing a guy in the military, okay? And uh, he offered me a ride home, and uh, my parents did not like him at all. But he suggested 
within the year that you'd be great at real estate. Why don't you quit your job as a waitress and mm. become a real estate agent? And I was good at it right away. It was like playing for me, just opening doors, chatting people up and seeing apartments. It was wonderful. So had you ever done sales prior to that? Well, I, I did, yes, I actually did, because I think of waitressing as one of the ultimate best sales positions in life. You have Good to point. please people, you have to deliver service, you have to keep them coming back, you have to find something about them to hook them in and, and, and uh, talk about themselves. It involves all of that, and what's great about waitressing, <laughs> this is not an ad for waitressing, but uh, what's great about waitressing is you get paid fairly for your service. In other words, you're great at it, you get a bigger tip. You're not good at it, they don't leave you a tip. Mm. And so I, I felt like I was selling my whole life. For me, honestly, my jobs were uh, a relief from being in that jailhouse of school from nine to three when that bell rang because I could actually go out and talk and kid with people and be myself and not use reading or writing or math in any regard and stand on my own two feet. So I really uh, liked all my jobs very, very much. I felt successful at all of them. So, so let me ask you, you just commented on that before to getting into the story. What, what do you think about uh, the educational system? I think you've commented on that a couple times. Mm -hmm. uh, how, if you were able to make any kind of changes to our current educational system, what would it be? Well, this is a, a tall challenge and nobody's quite been able to pull it off. Uh, and I, I'm not the one. I'm not going to live that long to see it happen, I don't think. But I think uh, what the educational system really lacks is real life experience. I mean, for the most part, mm. I have a 12 year old at home now, Kate. I could see she's kind of studying the same stuff uh, that I was studying in the same fashion. And she has an issue with reading. That's the way it works sometimes. She does as well. Oh, very much so. More so than I had, if that's possible. And my son, who fortunately graduated uh, from a very good school, he was dyslexic. So I just get all the clunkers, I like to say to my kids. <laughs> They laugh. They think it's funny. Maybe you don't think it's funny. But um, back to the educational system, uh, Katie is phenomenal at YouTube. Uh, my, my daughter Kate, uh, my son Tommy from the get-go is great with reading people, uh, running the playground, uh, telling kids what to do in the nicest way that they wanted to follow them. So he was a natural born leader. And none of that came out in school because all they were focused on is reading and, and, and mispronouncing every word that was in front of them. And so I think in the educational school system, there needs to be another platform where kids can shine, kids can perform all the other traits. And frankly, of all the entrepreneurs I've met in my life and all the millionaires and billionaires I've met in my life, mm -hmm. their gifts are not necessarily reading. Their gifts are people management, people motivation, leadership, wow. uh, enthusiasm, uh, understanding the big picture versus the minutia picture. And so all the gifts that you really need to succeed in real life business, and of course that's my chosen path, I don't know if it applies to the rest of life, really have nothing, to, I don't wanna say nothing, I shouldn't say that, but not much to do with what you're learning at school. Unless of course you're gonna be an attorney or a doctor and you have to pass those exams, that all makes sense. But other than those uh, disciplines, I think uh, the school system just How has to make room that? for winners versus making kids feel like losers because they don't fit that mold. How do we measure that? How do you think measure we measure what? that? Measure the people skills, measure the reading people. It's very easy to measure reading skills because there's a million tests and a million labels for when they go wrong. Um, but no, how reading you, people. Oh, reading, reading people. people? Oh. You were talking about your who, son could you read, read people, people early. Let me tell you, he surrounded himself with great friends. He never had a bad friend. They're all clean kids, nice kids. Uh, really, he just picked out great friends. Nice. If he was in any situation in sports, he was the team captain. If he was on the playground, he had the ideas that people were willing to follow. Mm. Uh, so he was obviously reading his ability to get people to, to do what he wanted them to do. Okay, so you go into real estate. You meet Ramon, you get into real estate, and yes. you're doing real estate. You love going out there and doing that. How does, how does that career take off? Well, initially, it was great from the beginning. It was the best job I ever had, even though I loved all my jobs, because it didn't feel like work. And the major difference when Ramon gave me the $1,000 to start the business and he took 51% and I was the managing partner of 49%, uh, the major difference was I didn't have a boss. I didn't know the beauty of not having a boss until suddenly there was no boss and I decided what I wanted to do minute by minute, who I wanted to be, how I wanted to approach things. I was the boss and being the boss 
for me, it was like, I don't believe it. I feel like a queen. I feel like, my God, I'm powerful. I was, I was powerful in my little, you know, whatever. But I, my mind, I thought, whoa, I can see the horizon. <laughs> I was able to dream because I could see myself as the lieutenant going over the cliff, not the person, can I, can I get Tuesday off, please? <laughs> now, how old were you at this time? When was... um, well, I was 23 when I started my business, and then I was with Ramon Simone as his partner for seven years. Then he left and married my secretary, and then I ended the business and started the Corcoran Group when I was 30. And that became my real business that made me my fortunes. Yeah. So that's the business that made you the fortune? Yes, of course. So yeah. what did you do differently with Corcoran Group that was different than the prior uh, venture you had? I didn't do much different in terms of day to day, but I had a head shift. I suddenly thought to myself, watch me because when I was leaving Ramon Simone on that Friday morning and taking my seven half of the company mm -hmm. out with me uh, he said you'll never succeed without me and I think he gave me he the greatest to you. let me tell you thank God he said that to me because when I heard those words I thought to myself mm. watch me I'd rather die and let me tell you something that was my insurance policy for success and I know uh, that's an attitude shift, and maybe not even from a good place. I probably need a good shift to get over, a good shrink to get over myself. But that shift in my mm. gut gave me power. Interesting. And so wherever you get your power, you know, it's amazing. I meet so many of my entrepreneurs. I'm always looking for the magic sauce before I put my money in them. And very often the recurring magic sauce is they have something to prove. And many proving an insult is not true. So I love an entrepreneur that has something to prove because it gives that extra juice in that engine and it's self-propelled. And that fortunately for me was what I had. So in answer to your question, I know I haven't given you a word in edgewise, sorry for that, but I'm more like my mother as I get older. <laughs> but um, in answer to, to your question, what was your question? And now I'm like my what father. Was okay. What was different? What, what was, was different, different about was it? the power so of being to, in charge. To prove. I was a boss before. Okay. But I was a boss now, but now I had fervor in my heart to prove something once and for all. Yeah, and that gets you far in life. Well, let me let me ask you. So you go from being a waitress, then you go to being a realtor, right? Then you well, go actually, I wasn't a realtor, but I was a real estate agent. Yes, real estate agent, and then you're 49 forty nine percent owner, mm -hmm. and then you're you're the boss. Mm -hmm. And so now was a part of your job to develop other salespeople as well to go out there and. You when know, in the first business, second, 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 that second was business. well. I went into my second business clearly selling because I was a good salesman. I needed the money. I mean, it paid a lot of bills, but I had a very lucky break. Uh, we we rented apartments. That's how we got the commissions, got which it. was important because the commissions come in right away. You don't have yes. to wait for months, so that's important in a young business. Um, but I had a very lucky break where Merrill Lynch, who I got a lot of rental kids from to show apartments to, mm -hmm. sent me a an engineer and I found out by mistake, they had mistakenly sent him to me. He was looking to buy, not rent. I had nothing to sell him, mm -hmm. but I schmoozed him up, gave him a tour of New York, told him I'd teach him values, teach, you know, how you know values in New York today. No different, I discovered it that day. You look and see what a garage rent is per month and multiply it with a few zeros and that's the cost of a one bedroom in the neighborhood. You could really just go to any neighborhood and figure out what Good a one amount. bedroom wow, that's It's all real estate. Okay, but a little sidewinder there so, so that you know where to buy and where not to buy. <laughs> um, but this particular young man uh, actually bought an apartment and I took that commission check in my hand. It was, uh, I forget what it was, 85,000, which sounds preposterous, but decent then. And I knew what 6% was and I said, God has destined me to take this 6% and start a sales division. I hired my first salesman that day. Not that day, maybe that week or so, mm -hmm. but right away, it was burning a hole in my pocket. And that became the conversion of the Corcoran Group. Uh, we kept rentals a number of years, but I converted it to a powerhouse of salespeople. What, what is the biggest difference on what worked for you when you were selling and what worked for you when you were helping me sell better and become a better salesperson? What were the dynamics between the it's two? It's totally different. When you're selling, uh, your customer is clearly the person on the street that you're trying to sell real estate to. That's your God. You gotta be hyper-focused, listen hard, really do everything in your power to make them feel like they're the luckiest person in the world that they found you and mean it and really perform. When I shifted from direct sales, which mm -hmm. is the immediacy of cash coming, which is a hard thing to let go of and have confidence, when I'm selling through you, the most important trait is I recognize what your God-given talent is and I blow it up. 
I make a big thing of it. Because if I could convince you that you have this special thing that no one else has in the world, well, maybe not in the world, but did you ever realize if I could spot it and underline it and emphasize it and make an environment for you that you're gonna bloom in, you're gonna make more money for me, you times a thousand people than I could ever make for myself by a lot. But it's different when you're working and hiring people. You have to see, A, do you have talent? Can I make you into something I see in you? Uh, do you have the stamina to run the course and really make it happen? Uh, and will you be loyal to me once I make a star of you? I built more stars in New York of my salespeople because I adored them, loved them, knew what they had, made them believe they became giant money, win money makers. But what good is that if I'm grooming them for the next big company? So you have to be able to keep them. In, let me, let yeah. me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Was it a uh, process you had in your mind where it's, I can take anybody off the street and I can make them a successful No way. Okay. People have so to have the goods. The so what were the goods to you? I'm looking for positive energy. Uh, I'm looking for a good family. They're from good, I don't mean wealth. I would prefer somebody poor, honestly. But I'm looking for them coming from a family that loved them because people who were loved uh, wind up doing better in life. And I can't do anything about that. If their parents didn't love them or find them lovable, how am I going to find them lovable? And then I'm really looking for the acumen of people judgment. Because I don't care what kind of business you do, what kind of business you start, if you're good at judging people and then motivating them or mm -hmm. leading them, you're going to have a hit. You're going to have a hit. I used to think, oh, I could be a plumber and I'd have a big plumbing company. I'm sure of it. What do I like about plumbing? <laughs> but as long as I hired the right plumbers and got them thinking better of themselves than they did the day before, all of that makes makes this successful business it's the only important trait. This really. is so powerful. Yeah. This is so powerful what you're talking about. So now let's fast forward. How big did you get and what happened the day when somebody came in said, hey, uh, we'd like to buy this? Well, it didn't quite roll out that way. I started my Corcoran Group when I was 30. I sold it when I was 48, 15 some odd years later, and I wasn't thinking of selling it. I loved my work. I loved every minute of it, but I had a baby. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but at 46, I had my first child. And the minute Tommy was put in my arms, everything shifted. I'm like, God, I got a problem. I mean, I was so joyful. It took me so long to have a baby. But I thought, what am I going to do now? And again, I had that big shift in my heart. And all of a sudden, the salesperson who was so demanding that I enjoyed every every little tiny thing that they were so demanding of, I looked forward to solving their problem. All of a sudden, I want to be home with Tommy. I want to be home. And I found it very hard to be a super mom at work, which I really think I was, because I lived and died for my salespeople. I'd do anything for them and be a super mom at mm -hmm. home. And so I felt something I had to give. But then, what? just coincidentally, that same year, boom, I made my first huge profit at the Corcoran Group. I was able to take home a couple of million dollars. I never made money because I would spend it before I came in on opening another office, opening another office, opening another office. And so all of a sudden, I think I had almost $3 million. I'm like, how did first that time happen? Ever. First, first time, time, time that ever. Kind of money. I think I had like 40,000 the year before. Seriously? Like, yeah, like was that a kind of a Well, I had opened so many offices and you know, it took it. about a year and a half before an office to really kick in and start catching up with your overhead. I had a certain science. So I you're saying when it caught up, it was a combustion. It was an mm. accumulation. That and came I thought, in. wow, I bet somebody would pay for this if they could make $3 million yeah. a year. And um, I called up the attorney that represented the, uh, was on the board of one of the largest uh, real estate holdings. Mm -hmm. I said, knowing it's a conflict of interest, but I said, I'd like to sell my company. I wonder if you'd get me a good price. No problem, he said. And he came back and gave me $22 million. I remember I was on a chairlift skiing with my roofer brother, John, when I got the call. And uh, I was early days of cell phone. Like, and it was, <laughs> I got you such a price, you're not going to believe it. You see it? Yeah, on a chairlift over high in the sky. <laughs> Get ready. Here it comes. $22 million, Barbara. Could you believe it? I said, I want 66. <laughs> That's it. My brother's name. <laughs> It was so much fun for In, us. Immediate reaction, immediately. you want 66. Well, six is my lucky number. So I knew I didn't want six, because that would be stupid. But I feel I'd double it, 66. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the best part about selling your business, getting a load of cash, if you're kind of naive on, and you haven't done it before, is where does the money go when you're at those closings? All you're doing is signing mm -hmm. millions of mm -hmm. papers with good counsel and good accountants. So you trust your people, signing, signing. But it never crossed my mind, where's the money? I should have said, do I get my check now? But the next day I'm at the Citibank machine on Madison 89th Street and I get my usual $200 uh, 
a month, a week rather. I always did it the same day, and that was the day. And I put my card in two hundred dollars. You know that sound? Mm -hmm. I get my two hundred, put it in my wallet, and I always ask for the receipt, even though I throw it out. I don't know why. It's I still do it. Just throw it. <laughs> ask for it, throw it out, like as though they're going to get away with something if I don't get proof, right? So I pull out the receipt. And I'm ready to throw it out, and I see I have forty-four million dollars in my checking account. <laughs> That was more exciting than anything else I'd ever done in my life. Because it became real. Well, is it, it, it seemed it was absurd. Real or was I felt like, like it was in someone else's movie. <laughs> 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 but still, think of the. I got the twenty, the balance twenty two. I think six months later, I had a yeah you know, tear they put up. Yeah, yeah, right. The usual thing. Yeah. The usual baloney thing. Correct me if I'm wrong. I read somewhere where you said. When I sold, I was on the top before I sold. The day I sold, the next day, I felt like, what happened to everything that I was building? Because it was kind of like yeah. different. What was that? Because there's a part of it that's like, listen, yeah. this is my baby. You know what I'm saying? There's it was an a emotional... big part. It was my baby, not like my baby. What kind of mother sells their child? And everybody was so happy for me, but reportedly over the next six, eight months, everybody kept saying it's not the same anymore. Of course it wasn't the same. A corporation that takes over slices the top tier of your, well, my experience was your management tier. They say you're overpaying them, they're getting rid of them, replacing them with subordinate people. Like, of course I'm overpaying them, they're the best in the business. You know, it, everything changed. Uh, the demand for excellence in sales. Uh, I was very, uh, very on top of uh, letting people go who couldn't meet sales quota. I was not merciless, but I was, they knew what they were in for. I told them what they were in for, and if they didn't meet those demands, they fired themselves because they knew those were the rules. I mean, once you're a big parent company, you, you, people get lost in the shovel, people languish mm -hmm. on the vine for mm -hmm. years. It's, it was so different, mm -hmm. so, so quickly so different. And so I felt like I almost ruined my family. <laughs> like I was, like I gave, there was nothing wrong with the parent company. It's a typical scene but I felt like I hired the wrong babysitter <laughs> and I I was out away from my kids it was just terrible and so also what, the what importance advice on that? what what advice on that so if somebody is in that oh. process and they're re honestly yeah. because you know the first time you do it you don't really know what's going on no so because you're thinking oh my gosh I'm getting this 66 million dollar check I'm gonna give all yeah, so my guys you're that, blinded by the light to a degree you're blinded yes. by it. so if you were to counsel somebody who's about to go through it what would you say to consider um I would say uh to go and get psychological help. I know that sounds, you know, I really, I'm not trying to be a wise guy. I think if, or if go to a board, like I had access to many uh, great entrepreneurs who had sold their business in New York through the YPO Association. Mm -hmm. I never asked one of them what happened afterwards. All I knew is they, they were very rich. That's all I saw. I should have really just known what was coming. Not that it maybe would have made a difference in what I did, but I would know what I was in for. And I would also say I would have had a plan as to what I was going to do next. I thought I would take cooking classes and really learn to be a better Italian chef. That's what, what you would do next. Yeah. yeah. I was going to take cooking classes. I was going to go to the park with my son and push him on the swings. After about eight seconds on a swing, it's like, okay, done. Come on, we'll go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was wired for like accomplishing everything. So I really had this like little Pollyanna, oh, nothing to do, a calendar that wasn't in minute by minute plan. Oh, how that would feel. No, I should have tried a week of a calendar with nothing planned. See how I respond to it. I would have wow, gone nuts. Wow, that's yeah. amazing right but, there. But sometimes you have to abruptly do something to do it, to get it done. Interesting. And, and so maybe, so it's easy to say, I would have, should have, could have. The fact of the matter is you adjust. You adjust and then you replace the empty hole that you created in your life with many other new things to fill it if you're aggressive and you're determined enough to do it. So next phase, Shark Tank. What happens after that? How, how does after how does Shark, shark Tank? No, I'll how probably how does, dead. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you mean after how Shark Tank? After that, how does Shark Tank come about? Like how oh, did the whole thing come shark, about? That yes. whole thing. Well, Shark Tank, I was doing TV work as a real estate expert. The real estate market accommodated me, it crashed. Mm -hmm. And so as you know, good news prints. So I pumped myself up as a real estate estate expert for the morning talk shows and eventually landed a job at the Today Show doing real estate segments twice a week. That was a job, okay? And I realized I have a job. Not much time, not much of a job, but I have a job. Mm -hmm. I'm a value. I'm still a value was my thinking. I thought I was a husband, you know? And then... Really? You're thinking that at that moment? Like you, you're oh, thinking you're a husband? Oh, of course. I'll tell you what happens when you sell your business. All of your contacts, in those days it was a large Rolodex, all of your contacts are useless to you. Once you have to redefine, a re, I call it repackage yourself. I don't think you have to give up who you are, but you have to think of a new package. How do you package yourself of value to something else? 
And so once I had repackaged myself and started getting a little traction as a real estate expert, mm -hmm. the only thing mm -hmm. I knew, um, Shark Tank called after about uh, three or four years of struggling through that, and they said they had a new show called Shark Tank, and I thought it was a fishing show. I said, nice, but I don't fish. <laughs> the last thing I do is wait for a fish. Wait for a fish? I'd probably have to sink my own boat just to get over it, you know? <laughs> But um, when they explained what the concept was, the recruiter, I said, oh, I'd be great at that. That's just like hiring salespeople. Same thing. I'll do it. I'll do it. And I signed the contract without reading it. But then I found out, uh, right, maybe a week and a half before I'm supposed to fly out there, the plane fare didn't cut, the, the arrangement wasn't made, which is kind of weird. And uh, then I got the call. They changed it. I hired another woman. They only had one female seat, and they were deciding. They had decided on someone else. I just couldn't believe it. Oh, you got to be kidding me! Yeah, and I had a new luggage set. In fact, I bought a fancy new luggage set. <laughs> I I looked the part. I didn't have the part, but I looked the part. And um, so you got it. They took it back. They give it. Well, some I didn't get it. See, shame on me. I signed the contract. That doesn't mean you got it. That means you have an offer in. I didn't see it that way. Mm. Okay. All right. So I Lots didn't of have the deal. Here. I didn't. Yeah. It's not over till it's over. Who's the baseball guy that said that good one? So true. It wasn't over, but now it's over. And so um, I'm very good at coming up out of the dead. That is my forte. If someone hits me down, that's when I'm at my best. And so after I felt sorry for myself, which I did for about a minute, I'm good at that too. I only give myself a minute. I'm like, I got a minute to be open with me. Get right back up. And I wrote a very good email. And I shouldn't say I. I did it with the help of um, Gail, my assistant, and Carol at the office. We put our heads together, boom, 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 the three of us. And we banged out a great email, short, succinct, where I told uh, Mark, uh, Mark Burnett, the biggest Hollywood mm -hmm. producer, I didn't know who mm -hmm. he was at the time, uh, that he had made a mistake. And I considered his rejection a lucky charm because everything in my life happened on the heels of the rejection. And then I cited all the worst things that hit me coming through the ranks and how I how they became my best things, which were the truth. I just said bullets. And uh, I, of course, know important people don't read their own emails very often. I made the woman who called me, one of the many assistants he had, promise she'd walk it over to his desk. That was key, the delivery. And she did. You called before you sent the email? Of course. You think I'm going to send it to Mark Burnett and think he's sitting around on his computer, he's going to read? The biggest Hollywood producer? I don't think so. Uh, Charmin, was Sherman or Char Charmin, I think was her name. And she promised she would. She walked it over and then she called me. I said, stay there. He said, she sounds like a shark. <laughs> and then the next day, oh, I ended the email suggesting he invite both women out to compete for the seat. And that's what he did. And thank God. And that got me my spot on Shark Tank. Yeah. So it's, it's again, in my life, it's always been every good lesson, every great That's lesson. That's a great story. That's well, a very, very good story. It's motivational because it should be, because the reality is you don't know how close you are unless you stand up for yourself. I so, okay, you become a, a, a shark. Mm -hmm. Shows start happening. Mm -hmm. You've never been to Hollywood before. You've never been to L.A. before. This thing takes off. What happens to you after Shark Tank takes off? Well, A, it didn't take off. It took three years. We were constantly getting messages weekly that it was going to be canceled by the network. So we didn't see it take off. We were always with our going out there with a leap of faith and hoping. Uh, the one thing I noticed on the first day on the set is the I had never been around camera guys filming a show, but they have massive equipment on the mm -hmm. set. It's like an airport hangar from the get-go. And uh, what I noticed is when we broke to reset up the next entrepreneur, all the camera guys were discussing the deals. And I thought, this show's going to do well. Because we can engage people. Uh, you know, and they're fixing up the cameras and do what they're mm -hmm. doing, but they're talking. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have gotten that guy. I saw the engagement right away. So I thought it would be a hit show, but it was a lot of guesswork the first three years. Once it really started gaining its traction on its end of the third year, we started building audience and people started saying, and I started posing for selfies. It was a very good sign on an airport. The more I posed for selfies, it was my barometer as to how well the, how well the show more was doing. More people knew it and yeah, recognized yeah, yeah, the show. Yeah, right. Like in the beginning, it was like, could I get a selfie? Could I get a selfie? And then the nine people around me, who's she? Then it was, oh, she looks familiar. And then it was like, I know who she is. That was a good sign wow, for the show. Wow, got it. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. So, so now, okay, let's talk about now the deal-making part, and then we'll wrap up. So the deal making part, while you're, you know, we, you see it on TV, it's eight minutes. How long is the actual beginning pitch to the end where a deal is made or they don't get a deal? Well, you see the whole pitch on TV when the entrepreneur comes out yeah. and says, blah, 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 why don't you join me in my business? Mm -hmm. You see that in whole, but what you don't see is the balance of that pitch for us as sharks on the set is 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes an hour and a half. 
And so they condense the editors, it's a genius editing job, plucking out the key pieces and the good TV in the pieces and making a very short, what is it at home? I think it's like six minutes. They do a fantastic minutes. job. Yeah, and it actually makes sense. It connects, right? Yes. Easy. Do you have yourself, you're looking at everybody. I mean, everybody's personalities. There. And by the way, the five of you mesh together like a, you know, when the Lakers had the team with magic, worthy, Kareem. It's like, it's just magical watching the five of you guys go at it together. Do you have some things where you say, no way in the world, I'm not doing this? Yes, I like this. Are there things that trigger? Yeah, definitely. If what I don't you understand say those things it, are? it's no way in the world. It could look like it's a, it could look like the most amazing <clears throat> thing in the world. But if it doesn't make common sense to me, I don't go near it because it's, I'm just going to have the anxiety of not understanding it and putting my money behind it. I don't think so. And I also feel unable to help that entrepreneur. I won't invest in anyone who talks fancy talk. If they talk like the sharks or like Kevin, like uh, with the fancy words. I'm like, they don't know what they're talking about. Or they might know those fancy words, but why are they hiding behind those words? I just want to know, like, hey, you know, how much does it cost you a month? Versus, what do you think? I don't even know those fancy words. And I've been listening now for nine years. I don't have them down. Um, so there are red flags, clearly. Uh, or if they don't have low energy, if they don't have good energy. High energy. I get that. I pick that up right away. They stand in front mm -hmm. of me. I know right away if they have energy or not. Um, if it's too well educated, I hate to say it, I never invest in anybody who's really well educated. Because I have rich parents somewhere along the way who's given them money to get started. I hope you're not rich. I don't mean to finish. Not that rich people can't succeed. I have a lot of, but for me, I don't do well with rich kids because they don't have the hunger, the need, uh, the, 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 the alcoholic dad who beat the crap out of the kid. <laughs> Whatever. I like all that stuff because you, it creates a rich tapestry of personality that succeeds at work. So I have all my what I don't do. I don't have necessarily have things that I have to invest when it says I have to invest now. Got it. So it's more. But I have to like don't. the person. I have to intuitively like the person. And when all else fails, and I can't read the person, which was rare that I don't get a gut reaction to someone, I think, what if there's a war and Tommy was a baby or Kitty was a baby again? Could I throw my baby into their arms and come back in five years and would my baby be okay? And I always say yes or no, clear as a bell. And that immediately clarifies when I'm a little uncertain because I've been confused by the language. So the best still. You've ever done? What would you say it is? Uh, Grace and Lace, I've made the most money with because it's owned by a husband and wife team who are each phenomenal entrepreneurs, one on the design end and one on the nuts and bolts dollar and cents end. And they've created a tremendous, phenomenal brand of great clothing, moderately priced online called Grace and Lace. And I won't bore you with the backstory, but they came from a place of emptiness to prove something, and that really helps them day in and day out. Okay? Um, I would say, and I know people get tired of hearing about it, and now Jim just got married on Sunday, so I'm going to have to drop him out of my most favorite. But definitely the cousins from Cousins Maine Lobster are so good looking, <laughs> such good businessmen. They're a pleasure to work with. They would have to, well, don't, I can't say favorites. They're all my favorites. <laughs> They're all your favorites. Every one of them. <laughs> Unless you're going to edit this and then I'll give you the scoop later. <laughs> Here's an interesting thing, maybe more interesting as to who's favorite and who's not. That's such a personal thing. What is interesting to me is that of all my wildly successful businesses that I've invested in, Every one of them meet with me, either by Skype or in person. We, we digest what's going in the business. We think about where we want to go. I give it my all each and every time. And yet, I find that my great entrepreneurs listen to every word. They never do a thing I tell them. <laughs> when I have an entrepreneur sitting at my table or on Skype, and they go, amazing, yes, and they're making notes, I'm like, I'm losing my money. <laughs> Isn't it funny? You would think the opposite. It's not that I'm stupid, but in the end, entrepreneurs walk to their own beat and do exactly what they want to do. And it's often right out of the gut, which is where it should be versus analytical. Right. Yeah, you yes. can't be a grandparent and coach from the side or a parent. You got to let the kid do what he's going to do. And so uh, I have learned that to be a good indicator. The minute the notepad is out, I'm like, slow down on the phones, will you? <laughs> Well, it's, it's definitely great to see how you process issues while you're wanting to choose to invest into a business. Phenomenal on TV, obviously, especially when you immediately call somebody out and say, no, this is not something I'm going to be investing in. And thank you for taking the time to come. Oh, on my pleasure. Thank you so much. Got a nice hairline, by thank the way. Thank you. Yeah, you do. Thank you. <laughs>